We are in the middle of a series of videos where we're looking at the relationship between acidity or basicity and stability and reactivity. And we started by looking at the four factors that we use to predict stability. And now we're at a point where we're looking at each one of those four factors individually, one at a time. And where we are now is looking at the relationship between resonance and the stability of a molecule. So just as a refresher, when we are trying to predict the stability of a molecule, the first thing that we wanna look at is the atom that holds the formal charge in the molecule. And if we cannot use that to make a prediction about stability, then the next thing that we wanna consider is the resonance structures for each molecule. When you are using this method to predict a molecule's stability, you need to draw or visualize as many resonance structures as possible for a molecule. So even resonance structures that are bad, you want to include those as well. And then what we are going to do after we've drawn as many as possible, we're just gonna simply count them up. The more resonance a molecule has, even if it's bad, the more stable a molecule is. Remember that resonance is a molecule's way of spreading out or delocalizing formal charges and electron density in general. So the more a molecule is able to spread out its electron density, the more stable the molecule will be. So the more resonance structures you can come up with, the molecule that has the most resonance structures is going to be the most stable. You are going to need to use a little bit of judgment. Um, for example, if two molecules have the same number of resonance structures, then you wanna look at how many uh, good resonance structures does each have. Or perhaps if one of them has five resonance structures, but they're all really bad, and another one has four resonance structures, but they're all really good, uh, maybe in that case you wouldn't want to go with the five bad resonance structures, and instead you would show preference for the four good. So use, use a little bit of judgment as you're doing this, but is a good rule of thumb starting point. The more resonance structures you can draw, the more stable the molecule is. We're not going to look at examples of that yet. We'll look at examples of that later because I feel like this is a pretty straightforward concept. If you can't use resonance to determine the stability of a set of molecules, then the next factor that we're going to look at is induction. And induction is um, simply just another way of talking about the delocalization of electron density. Delocalization of electron density not through resonance. So this is another way that molecules have to spread electron density out over a molecule. And this, instead of um, this happening through resonance, it happens through or because of electronegativity or electronegative atoms. So we're comparing these three molecules right here. Uh, if we wanted to rank these three molecules, which one is the most stable, the next most stable, and the least stable, we still have to remember, we have to respect our trick, ARIO. The first factor that we should always look at is what atom holds the negative formal charge. Oxygen, 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 because they all have the same atom with a charge. We cannot use A to help us predict stability. So now we move on to R resonance. How, uh, what kind of resonance structures will these molecules have? How many resonance structures will they have? We actually don't even need to draw them out to know that again it will be a tie because these molecules are structurally almost identical to each other their resonance is going to end up being identical. And if you wanted, you could take the time to draw them all out, but I can assure you that they will all have the same number of resonance structures. So R is not gonna be a useful tool for us either in this. And that means that we now have to move on to I. So induction, is when the molecule is taking this negative formal charge that's out here on the oxygen and it is delocalizing that negative formal charge over a larger area. So instead of causing the negative formal charge to be stuck on the oxygen, something pulls electron density away from the oxygen and helps to spread those electrons out. Induction 
happens when you have an electronegative atom near the negative formal charge. So for example, in these molecules, um, on this molecule, we do have an oxygen present. And in the next molecule over, we've got an oxygen as well. So these are electronegative elements. And it's exactly the same for all three of these. So the delocalization that this molecule may be experiencing from this nearby oxygen atom is going to have the same effect on all three of these molecules, not going to be a factor. However, as I'm sure you've noticed, the two of the three molecules have a chlorine, which is very electronegative. And that chlorine is able, because of its electronegativity, is able to pull electron density away from the oxygen's negative formal charge towards the chlorine atom, and that helps spread the negative formal charge out over a larger surface area. So because the first molecule doesn't have the chlorine atom present, it is going to be, of these three, it is going to be the least stable. Now for the remaining two molecules, they each have a chlorine atom, but I'm sure you've noticed the chlorine atoms are not in the same position on the molecule. What we know about induction is that the closer the electronegative element is, the better of a job it can do at delocalizing the charge. So as this chlorine, because this chlorine is further away from the negative formal charge, it has a harder time dragging the negative formal charge towards it. Whereas this chlorine atom, because it's very close, is very good at pulling the negative formal charge. So we know that the uh, molecule that has the chlorine very close to the negative charge is going to be the most stable. And then this one will be somewhere in the middle. And we also know that induction is an additive property. So if I were to bring another molecule into the mix, like let's say... Let's say I did uh, this, put two chlorines on the carbon that's next to the negative formal charge. This guy would be now the most stable because it has more chlorines and each one of them is doing its job to pull electron density towards uh, away from the oxygen. So let's, how can we label this one? This one would be the extra very most. And if we cannot use induction or any either of the other two factors to help us predict stability, then the last factor that we're going to look at is uh, which or uh, what type of orbital is on the atom that has a negative formal charge. And this is only going to work when we have an atom with a negative formal charge. We're not going to see this or need to apply this concept very often. And so here, uh, again, we have three molecules to compare. The first thing, when we're doing comparisons, always we don't want to forget that we are always using ARIO trick every time. So the first thing that we should always be looking at is what atom holds the negative formal charge. And for all of these, it's carbon. And so it's a tie, and because it's a tie, we move on to the next factor, R, resonance. How many resonance structures do each one of these molecules have? They, they each have, like, none. No good. So then the next factor is I, induction. Are there any electronegative elements on these molecules to help delocalize the electron density? These molecules have zero electronegative atoms. And that means we're left with the last variable, which is analyzing the orbital that holds the um, negative formal charge. This particular carbon right here, because it doesn't have any double bonds on it, this is an sp3 hybrid carbon. That's a carbon atom with one bond to a carbon, two bonds to oxygen, and one lone pair. So it has four areas of electron density. This carbon atom with one double bond is an sp2 hybrid, and this carbon atom with a triple bond is an sp hybrid. The explanation for the stability using orbitals to help us determine stability has to do with the orbital size. So remember, we've talked about this before. 
An SP3 orbital is very P-like. It's 75% P-like, so it's very long. Whereas, let's draw SP next. SP is only 50% P-like, so it's very kind of round and stubby, more like an S orbital. And the SP2 is somewhere in the middle. So I've attempted to communicate like the, the length of each one of these orbitals with this drawing. Because the SP orbital is short, and stubby, and let's say here's the nucleus. So this is the carbon nucleus right here. And out here is where we have our negative formal charge. And the carbon nucleus, remember, is positively charged. So in this sp orbital, we have a nice short distance between the positive and negative charges of this particular atom. And this is good. Uh, and we see that the sp hybrid carbon atom is the most stable of these three because the negative charge is held physically closer to the positively charged nucleus. And let's draw um, same thing for our sp3. So here's our carbon nucleus and the nucleus is where we have the positive charge of an atom and then our electrons lone pairs are going to be way out here so there's the negative formal charge and the distance that we have in between the positive and the negative charge is quite a bit greater so the uh, the strength of the nucleus is not felt as significantly for, for this particular lone pair of electrons in the sp3 hybrid orbital. And so that makes this guy the least stable because, again, the negative charge is held far from the positively charged nucleus. And then our sp2 is going to be somewhere in the middle of stability with a moderate uh, in the middle explanation.